You are now listening to the Hunter's Advantage Podcast. We preserve the history and sport of hunting through curious conversation and action-packed hunts, as well as offering you tips and strategy for more successful hunts. everybody welcome back to the hunters advantage podcast this is episode number 165 and we are joined by michael ritchie of steel creek outfitters thanks for jumping on with us man how is the what time is it in montana and and how's the weather right now today uh it's been great lately uh we've been getting thunderstorms every day and lots of rain this year weather hasn't been too hot been pretty nice for being outside working so what's what's hot up there in montana because here in oklahoma it's like hot would be considered like 96 98 and the humidity is god awful yeah we're similar temperatures for hot wise we don't get the humidity like you guys get um i don't know it it bumps over 100 usually somewhere throughout the summer but like right now it's been in the mid to upper 70s um next week i think we're supposed to start bumping into the high 80s oh my Mm. gosh dude high 80s all (laughs) summer i could get used to that that's incredible i'm more of a uh a a fall winter folk i mean the sun i don't know i think i'm allergic to it (laughs) anymore to be honest yeah i i've been the last couple of years, my allergies have been getting worse. And so I've taken allergy medicines and oh, really? didn't realize that that makes you sunburn like twice as fast. So oh, I didn't know that either. Yeah, <laughs> I, I didn't either. My wife was reading it on the bottle. She's like, that's why you've been getting sunburnt so bad lately. I'm like, geez, thanks. <laughs> oh. So how was, uh, how was your spring bear season? I know it's, it's probably wrapping up where you are. I just got back from, uh, saskatchewan last month and first bear hunt it was incredible but how was how did your bear season go it was really good um started out good i had had a couple of guys from back your way that you guys know on on the first hunt and i think we well they each killed a bear and then we had a little wreck with the dogs and another bear i ended up killing a bear too and then we treat several more after that. Um, but yeah, it was, it was good. Uh, Montana just got our hound season for bears back about, well, this is our second year back with it. And it's just awesome that we can, we can do that again here. I, I've guided a lot in Idaho, so, you know, I'm kind of used to it, but, I it's nice hunting around my house and out of my own outfit and stuff. Yeah. What, I had never heard of the, I've already obviously heard people hunting with dogs, you know, for uh, whether it be deer or mountain lion, especially here very commonly. I never knew you could even hunt. I'm not a Western guy, so I didn't even know you could hunt and bear with dogs. What kind of experience is, is that like? It sounded from what Trent was telling us. Um, he sounded, he said it sounded, it was really, really fun. Yeah. It's, uh, it's a lot more action and just kind of a little higher, faster pace than say lion hunting or, well, I shouldn't say faster pace. Sometimes it's slower too. I mean, we, we had some days where, uh, when those guys were here, it was like prime time. We, they hit it so perfect that it was just, you couldn't have asked for a better week hunters being here. Um, but you know, like we, we ride around the truck a lot, put the dogs on the box and, uh, we have strike dogs. So the dogs will, you know, they're up on top of the box and they're checking the wind and stuff and thermals coming up the hill, down the hill. And, and then when my strike dogs smell a bear or supposed to be smelling a bear, they, they'll bark and let out a big ball. And, and then you let them down and see if they can put it on, put the track on the ground. Um, sometimes they're 
they're striking the, the wind so you know they may have to range out a long ways before they'll actually find the track you know they could be smelling that bear from several hundred yards away and you let them down and sometimes they can't find where the actual track is um so that can be frustrating we had a little bit of that go on when trent was here but hmm. so do you use the same dogs for like bear and then mountain lion and stuff like that or are they different dogs i use the same dogs um that being said i do believe there is you know about any dog you can make into a lion dog um but a bear dog takes a different different mindset dog you know i mean they got to they got to be fast and thorough you know to they got to be able to follow that scent um as fast as possible cuz cats are sprinters you know so you're following the track and as soon as the dogs start pressuring a cat they'll they go up pretty fast generally i mean there's places in the world where they you know have figured out that they can run away and kind of slink through the rocks and nasty stuff to get away but bears bears can run they can flat move and and have a lot of stamina so there is bear dogs um and then there's dogs that will chase bears there's a difference there you know i mean all of my dogs will chase bears but i have probably i'd say out of the six hounds that i have three of them are what i would consider bear dogs you know i mean the knock down drag out no quit they're gonna stick with it until you either tell them it's time to go home or they catch something. Yeah. So I would feel like the bear would be a little bit more aggressive towards dogs and mountain lions. Cause obviously, I mean, I know bears can climb trees too, but typically what, when you watch like a video or something, a mountain lion hunting, most of the time, kind of like what you said, the mountain lion gets treed fairly early. Is that kind of the same with bears and stuff? Like, like, are they pretty, you know, j just tree, they get treated and leave me alone type scenario, or do they kind of like lash back out? Um, yeah, I would say typically I have more, I don't know, more interaction with the bears on the ground, I guess. Um, the cats over the years i've had some cats that'll stand and fight um but generally generally they're going up yeah they may come back out they may jump again and run some more um but there's it seems to me like there's different type of bears there's bears that you know i don't know if they're just lazy or if they they just know or have learned that they just go up a tree and we'll leave you alone. Um, but then there's bears and I think size has some say in it too. Um, my experience, the little bears tend to run harder um, and longer. If you get a big bear that doesn't want a tree, generally they won't really run hard they'll just walk along on the ground and the dogs will be all around them you know trying to get in there on them and stuff and and they just don't care they're just like you know mm. what you can't hurt me and they've I, never been hunted before yeah <laughs> i'm just gonna, i'm just gonna go about my business as long as you don't get too close to me we'll be all right and and then there's big bears that you know, that lazy type where you're just like your dogs come in there, guns a blazing, and they're like, holy shit. <laughs> Go <up the> tree. <laughs> yeah. Those are the kind of like, but <laughs> I right. don't get, I like the, the long, hard runs too. They're just more frustrating. You know, you're, you're always in suspense of 
what's going on. You're like, I, you know, I, unless you can get in on them to where you can kind of see what's going on, you're this new day and age, you're looking at a GPS. So you're essentially playing a video game all day while you're yeah. trying to find dogs and, uh, you know, back when I was a kid with my dad and stuff, we just had telemetry callers. They just, at best, they just gave you a direction, your dogs were. You had to kind of follow along with them and try and keep up. Um, now we can kind of see where they're going, somewhat predict what they're going to do, get ahead of them. Or, you know, like when Trent and those guys were here, we had a bear that ran pretty hard and actually ended up kind of just walking on the ground for a long time and he was headed into no man's land we were getting ready to just you know walk it out and see if we could get in on them and they ended up making a hook back and getting back to a road that we could get closer to them on and and uh we did end up catching that one even it just flat out out ran us towards the end there dogs got tired and hot and thirsty so in texas where i live now from oklahoma but in texas you see a lot of people running like hog dogs and the you know any mutt that they can find they'll run on hogs it seems like and it seems like i've been out several times where it seems like the dogs are enjoying it just as much as the hunters enjoying it like you have to pull them off of it because of how much they love it do you see that in your dogs do they enjoy it more than you do or just as much oh for sure you know i <laughs> trent's kind of got me posting a lot of video stuff, trying to get my social media going just mostly for advertising but i get some negative kicks off of it sometimes and it's always people that are like oh i can't believe you force your dogs to to go into danger and into harm's way and it's like you know that's what these dogs are bred to do um i'd much rather them do that than sit over here in the kennel Mm -hmm. um their whole life or be a yard dog even you know i mean yeah yard dog has its luxuries but it's boring um my dogs they do it as much for themselves as they do for me i mean they do i do see where you know dogs are people pleasers most of the time um you can tell you know when i get to the tree the the volume voice will get louder because they know i'm there they're like oh dad's here we made it got to show off a little bit everything came together (laughs) that's actually one reason i ended up having to kill that bear when trent was here is we we caught that bear in its den we ran it back to its den and i would say probably my best bear dog i have he he realized that i was there and started getting brave and getting closer and closer and closer and trying to get in there with it. And that bear finally grabbed a hold of him and sucked him in the hole. And, what? and uh, I ended up having to basically shoot the bear at point blank. I mean, I, I touched him with my barrel and uh, it was Trent's got most of it on video. He kind of got distracted right at the shot and panned away so you don't actually see me shoot which is fine for having it on anything but uh you can hear the shot and everything and but yeah he chewed my dog's nose up pretty good and uh i thought it i thought it crunched his skull i thought it was going to be a bad deal but it ended up turning out okay well good deal yeah People who say that, like, you know, that's it's kind of like dog abuse or something like that. I don't think they've been around dogs long enough because kind of like what you touched on earlier is they were bred to do this. And I totally agree with that, because if you look at like a Border Collie or an Australian Shepherd or anything like that, even if you work with it or not, 
if you have cows or horses out in your pasture or whatever it may be, they're out there nipping on something. They're, they're, they're trying to round them up. Just they're working dogs. That's basically all they're, all they are. And, and that's what they love to do. And your dogs being bred and raised around all this track and stuff like that's sooner or later, like that's, that's what they enjoy doing. And so there's a consequences with, with, the track and the bear and the mountain lions just kind of what the story you just told, but there's also consequences in anything. Like let's, let's take it back to the Australian shepherd and the cattle or something, you know, a farmer uses an Australian shepherd to round the cattle or the horses or whatever. Then that thing has a very good chance of getting kicked in the head and one kick in the head, that thing's done. You know, everything has its dangers, but it's just, you know, oh, what is sure. it going to be? I believe that, uh, and you can ask my wife because she gets mad at me sometimes, but every animal that I own has a job, mm -hmm. whether, you know, we have a yard dog and his job is to keep an eye on the kids. That's his job. And he does pretty good at it. I, I don't believe in owning animals that don't have a job because what, in my experience anyways, what usually happens is they end up getting in trouble. You know, they, they're not, they're doing what you don't want them to do because they're bored because they don't have a job. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I have, I have a cow dog now and I pretty much use him as a hound and he's, and he's my companion dog, but, um, you know, he know he has his days when his stock dog instinct kicks in, you know, when we're out messing with the mules or the horses or something, and he thinks he should get in there and bite them and stuff, and I got to get after him. But if we're hunting all the time or if we're, you know, out on the trail working or something, he knows what his job is, and that's to, you know, keep bears and lions away from me or the stock or clients. Um, and when, when we're working all the time, he is never in trouble, but if he sits at home for a week, he's in trouble all the time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <I> mean, <laughs> he's running off or dragging roadkill into the house or something. You know, I mean, you see all these people, that have you know they which i understand they got to have a dog it's it's good my, uh, my fiance has three of them and they they have no purpose whatsoever so i mean <laughs> <laughs> well and and some people can have some of those and they're behaved but a, a big majority of people that have a dog or multiple dogs they don't have a lot of manners because they're so wound up from not doing anything, you know, that it's just, uh, I have a hard time with it. Mm -hmm. No, I agree. So you were talking about trend spare and that seemed like a pretty wild story, you know, it about getting a dog and all that stuff. But like, I know you come from, uh, past generations of like the outfit and type stuff. Is that the craziest instance you've had i mean it doesn't have to be dog related or anything like that but what's the craziest i guess uh, hunt or something you've been on whether that be mountain lion or bear um probably lion just because i've chased more lions than bears uh i've had some i've had some wild times bear hunting it's usually i don't know <laughs> It usually has its interesting moments more often than not. Um, but I have had some crazy lion hunts, you know, where the hunter makes a bad shot or the lion doesn't want a tree or, you know, and dogs are getting tore up and you just have to make those split second decisions. Um, I've had, yeah, I've had dogs, you know, I, I value all my dogs somewhat equally. Um, oh, you have your favorites. I know you do. 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like children. Everybody has their favorites, you know? <laughs> it's hard not. You know? and, and I think it's more so who's pulling their weight more. You know, there's definitely the couple that are like, well, really don't want to get in there and bite anything, but I would. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I have a problem with my dogs not being, you know, rip and tear dogs. That that really all that causes for me is vet bills. Mm-hmm. Um, and I don't want that. And and I don't want to start over with new dogs all the time either. So, um, but yeah, it's. I would say I've had some more interesting cat stories than bears just mostly because i ran more of them and i got more more material to work with i guess i uh i was hunting last month in saskatchewan and for a black bear my first time ever hunting anything that can hunt you back and it's kind of interesting we i was on on a platform that was probably six or seven foot off the ground And I had a black bear walk underneath me and I was expecting him to go to the bait site that we had set up. And so I kind of oriented myself more towards the site and I lost him for probably two minutes. I was like, where is this bear? The next thing I heard was his claws hit the stand, the, (laughs) the, uh, wood on the stand. And I turned around, I mean, full speed, just turned around. Cause I was like, he's not getting up in the stand with me. And he was sitting one hand on the top step and one hand, uh, one step down and just looked at me like that. And oh my God, that freaked me out. Like I, I was this close to like drop kicking him in the forehead or swinging my bow at him or something, but they were, I don't know. They have them little squinty eyes and he just looked yep. like he was trying to figure out what is that up in the tree? Yeah, no, for sure. And Yeah, I don't know. Bears, I guess bears and cats, neither one really. I've been around them so much that they don't bother me. Even even the bad ones don't seem to – I mean, they get my blood pumping, don't get me wrong. But um, I guess I have a respectful fear of them, and that's about it. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I don't like – wouldn't want either one of them to get a hold of me, but uh, God, not afraid to get in there either. You know, well, like I think I'd rather wrestle a bear than a mountain lion. That's a that's, oh, dude, that's a hundred percent for. Sure. for- <laughs> <laughs> I think that's painful for sure. There's just something about a cat that I'm just like that thing. That thing will mess me up, and like a bear, like yeah, it might gnaw on me or something, and not, and I'm sure it, you know it would hurt. But just cats, they're just. Mm-mm. Probably because I'm not around them enough, but I don't know. There's just something about them that I would not want to mess with whatsoever. You yeah. ever got into it with a 15 pound house cat? And they're just like, <laughs> dude, they're, <laughs> I'm sitting there like, if this thing weighed 50 pounds, it would kill me. They are yeah. mean. Yeah. They really are. What's a big bear in where you're at in Montana? Um, You know, spring bear, you're probably looking at a you know, what I would consider a really big bear would probably be bumping that 300 pound mark, you know, 285, 290, 300 pounds. Um, and you turn around in the fall and those are, you know, bumping 500 pound bears probably, God, you know, they probably put on at least another third of their weight <clears throat> in the fall it, on a good year. Not always, but. What's the biggest bear you've had? Um, you know, I've never weighed any of them, so I don't really know actual weight. I'm just guessing, but um, I've skinned some and squared some that were, you know, really pushing that seven foot mark. So well, that's a that's a big bear anywhere, as far as I'm concerned. You know, black bear. I know, you know, back east and stuff, they get some of them seven, eight hundred pound bears, but they're living in the middle of a cornfield and eating acorns and walnuts stuff. So, 
I mean, ours are eating bugs and berries and whatever dead carcass they can find. Scrapping around. <laughs> yeah, that uh, that one that I shot was two sixty, and it uh, it was it was funny because the outfit guy was telling me he said, you know, sometimes you'll shoot one that's. 350 and it won't go Pope and Young. It's got a little bitty head on it. Sometimes you'll shoot one that's 225 and it's got a melon on it. And the one I shot was was ended up being Pope and Young, but I thought that was interesting. All it all go it goes by the head. Yep. Yep. And I've shot some monster bears your clients have, you know, that I'm like, yeah, this one's definitely making the book and it's not even close. And you're like, mm-hmm. And and sometimes they might even just have a big old meaty head and their skull isn't that big. Mm-hmm. Is that is that age related or or what's what's yeah, that about? Uh, yeah, to a point. Um it's it goes similar to you know antlered animals too. I mean age plays an effect on it, but genetics also mm-hmm. effect. Um, and feed, you know, nutrition. Yeah. You got a, when I, they got, just got my European mount, mount back of that bear and it had a pumpkin on it. It looked like, and they got it all whittled <laughs> down when it was boiled down. And I was like, Oh, this isn't nearly as big as I thought. It was. I thought it was going to be like this big. Dude, it wasn't. The first thick on them, whenever you, whenever you swung by and showed them to me, like the fur was like that thick and they're like, Oh yeah, it's springtime. You know, like they don't have much meat on them. I'm like, I'd really hate to see it with meat. Mm-hmm. Those things. I don't know. That's- thing like prey, prey animals are one thing, but when you, when you see like a predator, it's almost like an eerie feeling. You know what I mean? Oh yeah. Yeah. I seen a, I was at work today. Uh, Oh, kind of in my off time, I spray weed for another outfitter, and I was running around on the four wheeler today. I seen a sow and two cubs, and uh, I seen her. Well, I'd seen a black spot on the side of the hill three or four times today, and it never seen it move. And I'm like, I know that's a bear, but it just doesn't look hasn't moved for a couple hours, and. I was driving back up and I seen one of her cubs go darting across the hill and I was like, I knew it was a bear. And so I, the next trip up, I uh, brought my binoculars and looked over there and it was a bear playing under a tree and her cubs were playing all over the place. And uh, But yeah, I guess probably for me, I very seldomly don't have a gun. Probably most of the time, always almost have a dog with me. Too. So I guess maybe that's one reason and really bothers me. <laughs> yeah, that's funny. And I live, you know, I'm, I'm with them all the time. I'm constantly chasing and, and just intermingling with them throughout throughout the year so i guess it's just a comfort zone but yeah it's almost like second nature to you now so after listening to like trent's story about about coming up and hunting that bear with you uh i started creeping your website and i noticed you guys do wolf hunts too yeah and Uh, a wolf is something i don't know what what it is about them it's almost like a I don't know. It, it's it, it's one of my bucket list items as a wolf, and don't ask me why. I know it's just a bigger coyote, but there's just something about them that I find so fascinating. So how do you all how do y'all do that? Do you use dogs with those two, or do you just try uh, to locate them? No, we mostly just uh, usually we hunt them in the winter. So you know. Direct- either riding around a snowmobile or truck or on foot trying to find tracks and then either track them kind of track them down to where we know or we think we know we're in hearing distance try and call them um i've had the most luck howling at them so they think you know you're kind of a outcast wolf following their territory and um 
I've had a lot of good luck calling to them like a coyote, you know, challenge howl or something, and they'll they'll come in being territorial trying to kill that coyote. Uh, but honestly, wolf hunting is 99% luck. I mean, it is just being in the right place at the right time is is 90% of wolf hunting, you know, I mean, my dad's probably one of the best wolf hunters I know personally, and it just, I've hunted with him, we've shot wolves together, and it's just like, <laughs> you can say you're good at it or not, but it's luck, you just, really? they're, yeah. The biggest problem with them is they just travel so much. Like they're on the move all the time. Like so, getting getting ahead of them or getting within that distance is so tough. Mm -hmm. You know, and then like with clients, it makes it that much tougher because you know you you work hard to get to them, and then you know somebody fouls up a shot or you know the typical you if it can go wrong it will go wrong murphy's law yeah. absolutely i know that by heart <laughs> <laughs> and hunting is like 10 times worse than anything oh no like i don't know it's like they have a an extra sense you know that and i think they do sometimes they stand there and look stupid too i mean doesn't well, really me but yeah, there's the Hunters Advantage podcast is powered by Out on a Limb Manufacturing. Out on a Limb is a family owned company based right here in Oklahoma that makes tree stands, saddle platforms, climbing sticks, and so much more. Christian, I have a quick question. What's that? What bites sound harder, a hippo or an alligator? No idea. It's a trick question. The Ridge Runner 2.0 bites harder than both of them. But all jokes aside, we use these products all across the land on public or private. These help us get into any tree we want and hunt where the deer actually are. Most men go to the grocery store for their meat, but these products help you go to God's grocery store. I have used the Out on a Limb Ridge Runner 2.0 and the Shakar Sticks for the last few years hunting public land bucks, and I've actually shot several bucks out of this setup. If you want to support the podcast and get some Out on a Limb equipment, make sure to go to outonalimmfg.com and use code HNTA10 for 10% off at checkout. Once again, if you want to support the podcast, Go to outonalimmfg.com and use code HNTA10 at checkout for 10% off. Now let's get back to the podcast. So for for the listeners, can you kind of tell like the size difference between a coyote and a, uh, a wolf? Can you kind of describe that a little bit? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I guess the biggest thing you'll notice is it's kind of it's kind of like comparing black bear to a grizzly bear you know i mean it's just that you know a coyote looks so dainty and and small you know and in the winter time it's tough like if you see one running or something you're for, my first instinct's always wolf just because i don't i like killing them but it their tail, their tail kind of hangs different. A coyote is more of like a a gun barrel type tail. You know, it's usually stays straight. Where a wolf will have a slight curl to it. Um, and then the size is just so much different. I mean, you you talk about a big coyote, and you're talking 30, 40 pounds. You know, and when you talk about a big wolf, you're pushing that hundred pound mark so Good I mean, God. <laughs> twice. um the length the length is what kind of really sets it off you know you see a wolf and you're like damn that's a huge coyote no it's not a coyote never mind <laughs> yeah and then, you know where we're at i know a lot of places don't but where we're at we have real high black wolf concentration you know so we have a lot of black ones where and i 
I know they have them in places, but I've never seen a black coyote. Um, I've seen pictures of black coyotes, but you can't mm-hmm. be talking about a black wolf. If you're getting Jake too excited. Well, that is, <laughs> I'm telling you, I'm telling you, I seen a picture one time. This was years ago and it was just, I don't know if it was on Facebook or just Google, but this person had a wolf and then a coyote hanging from a tree and just the size difference of them. I was just like, I need, I need me one of those because I'm, I don't know where I'd put the, 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 the pelt or whatever, but I need me one of those. So what about, what about vocally for like the wolves? Like, can you kind of distinguish between a coyote and then a wolf? Yeah. And if so, how, how so? So like a coyote will be real high pitched and generally uh, I think of a coyote howl, you know, or or a pack of coyotes being like hyenas, you know, they kind of got that real fast. The chorus. yippy. Yeah, re- yippy chorus where a, wolves will do it, but it'll be a lot deeper pitch and longer, like not so fast and choppy. Um and usually it'll start out with one wolf howling and then maybe a couple more will join in. And by the end of it, the whole pack's howling and they, they'll they usually howl big, long howls instead of, you know, that kind of yippy deal. I have heard those wolves do that yipping stuff, but it's, uh, my experience has been kind of more when, hey, get out of here. Yard dog getting in trouble. <laughs> it's, it's always the yard Where? one. Uh, more of like when the, they're made a kill or something, they're kind of celebrating that. That seems to be when I've heard them doing that yipping, growling, and carrying on stuff. Usually, if they're just howling to gather each other up or, you know, at dawn, at dusk or whatever when they're kind of just getting active it'll be more long drawn out howls and more it it's one of those things like when you hear it you're like oh there's no question you know yeah um honestly one wolf is like you can be walking along in a silent forest you know and when that first howl starts you just like freeze in your chat (laughs) is that a wolf oh yeah yeah that's a wolf and seems like uh at i had a hunter one time we were cat hunting and wolves are when you're lion hunting when you're hound hunting period wolves are your worst enemy you know i mean that because they'll come in and kill your hounds while they're running or tree in um so i had this cat client that was with me and his ringtone was a wolf howling the dogs were treed and we were walking into the tree and for some reason i wouldn't even have cell service there or i don't but he apparently got just the tiniest bit of cell service and somebody called him and that his ringtone went off and I like, I was far enough ahead of him that like, I didn't realize it was him and I just hear a wolf and we were getting pretty close to the tree anyway. So I just took off booking it to the dogs and left him, you know, there's a foot and a half of snow on the ground. It, should be able to follow my track <laughs> yeah. a couple of yards but i get to the tree and and then a little while later he shows up at the tree and goes man what happened back there you just took off like a bolt of lightning and i'm like well i heard them wolves start howling i wanted to make sure i got to my dogs before they did and he's looking at me funny and i'm like you didn't hear them wolves and he goes no i didn't hear anything and <laughs> It wasn't until we were walking back to the truck and he's like, 
oh, that wasn't wolves you heard. That was my ringtone. And I'm like, oh, no way. Really? <laughs> I just did the old last of the Mohicans sprint to my dogs for 300 <laughs> yards thinking they die, you know, because it, it, you know, it was right behind me. So it sounded so close and and pretty real. But he owed you a good meal up. after that. Yeah. Burn all them calories. Yeah. That's how you call a Michael Ritchie in right there. It's just do a. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. oh, no, that's awesome. No, I, I mean, I'm fascinated with wolves. I'd like to hunt them one day, like check it off my bucket list and stuff. But that is one thing I'm glad Oklahoma does not have as wolves that I know of because when I'm walking out there, you know, 4 a.m. or something to the deer stand, I don't. Like we already got to deal with like a few black bears, not many, but like, I don't, I I don't need any more predators out there. That's, that's, that's all I'm saying. I, I probably, you know, I, I've told you guys on here that, you know, I'm so comfortable with bears and lions. I don't necessarily fear wolves, but I give them the least amount of trust. Um. Is that a pack thing, you think, or just because? Well, and they're, they're just that, more of that, uh, I don't even know what to call it, but kind of cheap shot, mm. sneaky, you know, like. Blindside. Most people that think of wolves don't really think of them attacking humans, and most of the time they don't. Um, but when they there for a few years when they got so bad here kind of right before we got a season they got pretty bold and brave you know they were chasing guys around that had dogs with them that you know that were out shed horn hunting or just out for a walk you know and and they were after the dog mostly but you know the dog's gonna run back behind the owner and now they're after the owner because he's collateral damage, but, you know, and then in the dark is kind of where I don't really trust them a whole lot. Um, they just, they kind of give me that sucker punch feeling, you know, like if you let your guard down and it's the right opportunity, they're going to come in there and, and harass you. You know, they may not be bold enough to actually get a hold of you or something, but they're the ones that make my hair stand up, you know, when yeah. you're walking back to camp in the dark or walking out in the dark or something, you know, you just, you can't see them, you know, and, and I guess bears and lions could be the same story, but generally the only reason a lion would follow you is one, it's hungry or two, it's just curious. It, you know, it seen a flash of you walk by or something and didn't, didn't know what you were. And it, you know, it's like your house cat chasing that something they, you know, a mouse ran across the floor or something. They ran over there to see what it was more so than to go kill it. Um, you know, I hear, a lot of people where I'm at, oh, yeah, the, you know, I was out hunting the other day and a cat was stalking me. And I was like, well, was he stalking you or was he just trying to figure out what you were? Mm -hmm. oh, he might not have smelt, you know, because a lot of it is sight and smell, sound. Might have just heard something and went to check it out. Just kind of that curiosity deal. Um, and I've with black bears anyways, I've never had a black bear give me that eerie feeling, you know, usually, usually they're, they hear or smell you, they're gone, you know, they're out of there. Um, aside from just kind of surprising them on the trail or something and they stand up and look at you or, or in Idaho where we can bait, going into bait, sometimes they they don't get defensive of it, but 
sometimes they're like, well, I know you're just going to dump some bait in the barrel and leave. So I'm just going to sit here and watch you and come back and eat all your bait. Um, <laughs> That's awesome. I've had a couple of those ones. Not really scare me, but you definitely keep an eye on them because they're, you know, you're like, you should run off and you're not. <laughs> so. Yeah. I want to, I want to talk a, a little bit about the lions because I'm really, really fascinated with mountain lions. I've, I've watched several videos of people hunting them and I'm trying to do the super slam. And it's one that I think is, I'd like to do relatively soon. So when do you, when do you go after mountain lions and kind of what is the, what's the hunt like for them? Um, so my hunt is where our season opens December 1st and goes till April 14th. Mm. We don't usually hunt them. Well, I usually chase them every minute I can. Uh, but as far as just the hunt, you know, I usually do an eight day hunt and kind of depending on which camp we hunt out of, it's uh fire alarms are going off like crazy around here yeah and so i do two different style hunts i do a backcountry hunt which is in the wilderness and it's all on foot um you know you're walking rivers and trail systems and stuff just looking for tracks and free casting the dogs uh, free castings just where your your dogs are loose and they're looking for their own track as much as you're looking for a track um a lot of times they find it before you do or they'll cast up on a ridge or down in a creek bottom or something and find a cat that may just be hanging out down there that actually didn't leave a track for you to find so um that can be good that the dogs are out ahead of you or behind you or to the side the other hunt that i do is i guess what we call a front country hunt um and that's where we're hunting out of uh four-wheel drive pickups or um snowmobiles and we'll drive roads in the snow and and look for tracks and then turn the dogs loose on the tracks from there um and then you know, as far as the actual chase goes, the length of your chase on a, a cat hunt is kind of more determined on how old the track is, you know. So if the cat walked through there 12, 14 hours ago, it may have went 200 yards and killed a deer and be laying right there, or it may have covered five, six, 10 miles you know, in the last 12 hours where your dog's got to make up that time plus put the pressure on them to make them climb. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you, you can have some real fast ones where they pop up, you know, you turn them loose and dogs barely get out of sight and the cat goes up the tree or you can have those ones where <laughs> you're walking back to the truck in the dark at the, at the day. So, what is the, what's the success rate on a hunt like that of like tree and them? Like, do you, is it in an eight, eight or nine day period of time? Is it pretty common to get, you know, a couple treed in that time period or is there that not that many of them? Um, again, it kind of depends on the, the area that I'm in. Um, but I would say typically, typically in, I'll go off of like, say my last 10 years doing it, um, on an eight day hunt, I think my average usually is around three to four lions a hunt, you know, that we tree. Um, don't be talking like that. I'm, I've got, I'm, I've been lo <laughs> looking at my wallet right now. <laughs> you know, the, the, tri the tricky part is, is finding the one that is big enough to, to harvest. Um, is I, that like a regulation or is that just the uh morale thing um so any adult lion is legal to kill 
in Montana, there's sub quotas. So you can only kill so many males and so many females Mm. season. Um, but I typically don't kill the females. You know, I'm, there's few circumstances that every once in a while it has to happen. And I'm not saying that none of them should ever be killed, but there's enough people besides me that kill the females that, you know, it's just kind of how I was brought up and they make my living for a a big portion of the year. And I kind of manage my cats the same way that I would manage my elk or deer herds, you know, I don't kill those females because those are my baby makers, you know. I mean, uh, you know, you you listen to all your elk and deer hunters, and they're crying that they want less cats, and <laughs> I'm crying that I want more cats because <laughs> I, I like to chase them, you know. But I, it, uh, I don't know. There's just once you see. You know, okay, so we'll go here first. There's adult lions, there's adult males, females, and the males are called toms. And there's small toms, there's decent toms, and then there's giant toms. And once you've seen a giant tom in the tree, you have no interest whatsoever in ever killing a female again. I mean, I know that a female, an adult lion period for somebody that it's going to be a once in a lifetime deal, it, it really wouldn't matter to them. But if you could show every client that difference, it, it'd be a hands down, you know, like, holy shit, that is. <laughs> that that's what or you know and so as far as like me and my outfit you say you come on a cat hunt with me and you kill a i would say it'd be a 99 percent chance that you wouldn't kill a female with me but say you did you take it home and have it mounted and it's this you know 70 80 pound female I don't, even though you had a great time or whatever, I really don't want that little tiny cat being the representation of, of my outfit. You know, I mean, I want you to go home happy, but I also want you to go home with something that when somebody walks in your house and sees it, they're like, holy shit, that's a, where'd you get that? Um, My dad's always been known someone for killing big toms you know uh dad's got a pile of cats that are record book cats um i'm a long ways behind him but i'm i'm creeping on him trying to get some of those record cats up there um and honestly the record book doesn't mean anything to me really it's just that extra icing on the cake um but a big Tom's a big Tom, whether his head makes the the score or not. Um, so what's a big Tom? So you said the females are like 70, 80 pounds. I, I don't know if we've already covered this or not, but if so, I forgot. But what's a, what's a giant Tom you were, you were speaking of? Um, so, you know, your average female is going to be that, you know, 80 to, 75 to 100 pounds that's you know 100 excuse me 100 plus pound female is a big female um i've killed probably three toms in the last 10 years not me personally one of them was mine personally um that were bumping over that 180 pound mark oh my god (laughs) there ain't no way (laughs) There ain't no way. I can't beat up a 15 pound house cat. Could you imagine? You'll bear with me here for a minute. I'll go upstairs and show you one. Oh my God. That's nuts. 180 pounds. That's more than me. Dude. <laughs> yeah. That's more than me. <laughs> oh God. It's going to be worth 
the weight. Oh, 100%. Get it. Jeez. Jeez. I can already I'm gonna, see it. I'm going to full screen just for this. Dude. Can you there see it? No oh, way. yeah. Can't get a very good. Yeah, that, that oh, thing would no, mess you up. You're doing good. Trust me. <laughs> Dude, that thing looks obese. Just <laughs> That's that's one of my guides that works for me. That's his cat. Um, mine's downstairs, but he didn't have a place to put it his. So, well, if you need another place to put one, I I know a guy. <laughs> if I got one, that's exactly what I would do. I don't care if I had to like sell my truck. That's exactly what I would do. Hmm. That full body mount is cool. Yeah, there. Um, those both of those cats are uh, Boone and Crockett cats. What's a so? How do they score the? Is it the skull similar to a bear? Yeah, same as a bear. Length plus the width. What is the inches? Do you know? Um. So the minimum for awards is fourteen and a half, and Minimum for all time is 15 inches. The record is like 16 and four sixteenths or something, I think. And just to clarify, that's like the tip of the nose to the back of the skull. Yep. 16 uh, inches. The front no, of plus the width. Front of the teeth to the back of the skull and then the width of the skull. That's no, awesome. thank you. No, thank you. <laughs> so can you, I know we spent an hour here talking about basically a lot of the hunts that you guys do, but can you tell us a little more about kind of Seal Creek Outfitters and kind of maybe the lineage and how you guys got started and all that sort of stuff? Yeah. So, um, I'm third generation outfitter. Um, actually both of my grandpa's, on my mom's side and my dad's side, we're both outfit. Uh, my, my dad's dad, my grandpa, Gerald, he was, uh, he was an outfitter in the Selway wilderness for just maybe a year or two shy of 50 years. And had at one time had the largest outfitting area in the lower 48. Wow. And then, my dad didn't take over my grandpa's business, um, but it later, later on, after working for some other guys, started his own. Um, and I, I don't know how long dad was still doing it, but dad still got an outfit. He just sold one of his outfits, and he's just kind of more or less kind of semi-retired, you know, not retired, but he's still running hunts and stuff. And then uh, about six, seven years ago, I guess, I just took some time off from working for dad and went and was managing a cattle ranch. And me and the owners of that, place uh not really we're button heads but just not getting along and uh i don't know you just can't get if you're if you're truly into outfitting and guiding it's really hard to get away from it i've i've done a lot of different jobs and i keep coming back and when me and the ranch started button heads there was a outfit for sale and um, me and my wife had just got married and had a little girl and I just, just out of curiosity, I didn't even really have it in my mind that I wanted to buy it, but I called the people that owned it and just asked them for a price and they gave me a price that I couldn't. I mean, even if I didn't operate it, I couldn't help but not to buy it. Um, it was just a no-brainer. 
and I, I was already kind of living in the, the area that where the outfit was and so I bought it and it actually took over a year to get all the paperwork and everything finalized to where I could actually operate and then uh, the rest is kind of just history I kind of knew some clients that were my clients that I brought to dad's business and, you know, called them up and said, Hey, I got my own outfit now. You guys interested in hunt? And they're like, absolutely. We'll be there. Tell us when. And, um, I've been going to some sports shows the last couple of years over in Wisconsin and picked up some clients and that I met a guy at one of those sports shows that ended up running into Trent. And that's how I got hooked up with Trent is uh, they kind of knew each other. And he, he told them that I should get, or told me I should get a hold of Trent and ask him about doing some video. And, and so we kind of just got into it with that, but but yeah, as far as just my business and stuff, you know, I, it hasn't been easy. Like, <laughs> and I don't, I don't regret it not being easy. Like it's rewarding, but yeah, it's, it's always a hustle. You know, you're trying to, you're basically trying to beg somebody to give you their money to take them hunting you know <laughs> like it that's you don't gotta beg me <laughs> and, and there's a lot of people that you don't have to but there's also a lot of people that would love to do it that can't afford to do it so yeah um and so last year i kind of reversed roles i went on a guided well a semi-guided caribou hunt in alaska and oh god so it was kind of a uh, role reversal and I, I learned some stuff for my own business out of the deal you know because I was the client I was the one asking all the stupid questions and um, just not knowing things and 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 being out of my element you know I've been never been up there hunting before I've been to Alaska several times but never hunting and so I kind of got a a new found respect for being the client you know i mean you're going somewhere with somebody that you've never met before and never been before you're lost you're you don't know what you're doing you know you even if you've hunted for years, years and years you're somewhere new you're with somebody different and um uh, it was an eye opener for me, I guess, as far as being on the other side. What What does it entail to buy an outfit? Are you basically buying a book of business? Are you buying land? Are you buying leases? Or I'm sure it's different in every scenario. But what does, does that come like? with clients? Or so generally, when you buy an outfit, yes, generally you're buying the business. Um, what that entails varies a lot you know like my dad just sold his one of his businesses and uh generally they'll come with camp gear um horses mules excuse me um client list sometimes like mine came with essentially nothing <laughs> uh, there was there was some camp gear and one horse left some saddles I, I should say nothing there was there was some value there but um and and i i paid you know for about what i got um but if you went and looked through my stuff now almost nothing is what i got that you know, i have I've upgraded everything. That doesn't mean it was my upgrade was brand new or anything, but it just the way that the previous outfitters operated was not how I was 
a custom outfit and so i've changed a lot of stuff and made adjustments and added st lots of stuff you know lots of horses and mules dogs and vehicles and snowmobiles and horse trailers and camp gear and um, i run a the camp that i run is a wall tent style camp you know wall tents wood stoves cots and foam mattresses do you have the a-frame or the traditional um so yeah like uh a lot of mine have internal frames um either or some some camps will build wood frames in some inside of them um but i have i still do use the the wood scissors you know to hold up the ridge pole and and then you tie the sides out to another pole yeah well those those if i had to set the traditional ones up where you have to tie them with all the poles on the outside he had all those lines i'd charge double i can guarantee <laughs> that we have one of those and it sucks <laughs> to put up yeah yeah uh, yeah, yeah if we if we put it up we're staying a week <laughs> yeah yeah they're not a pop-up style camping trip for sure um the internal frames do make them a lot nicer you know i granted i've been doing it since i was old enough to walk but i would almost well i've had clients tell me that i could but i try to stay humble but <laughs> i almost bet that i could set up a 14 by 16 wall tent before somebody could set up one of these new pup tents with all the little poles and stuff well and i tell you what Come November, you come down to Oklahoma, and we'll test that for you. How about that? <laughs> That's awesome. Well, why don't you uh, – I know you got a long list of it um, on your website and stuff, but why don't you kind of list out all the different things that you can you can hunt with you guys when uh, if somebody wants to come to Montana? Yeah, so we, we kind of specialize in elk hunting, or I guess that's just kind of our – our breadwinner um it's just honestly what i can sell the most of you know that's my biggest income was the elk hunts um probably the most popular the so we do elk deer bear lion wolf if you're super lucky you got that little leprechaun in your pocket you hunt moose sheep and goat um, that's very unlikely you'll draw a tag for that, but it is, it is, uh, possible. And I've done a few goat hunts. Haven't, I did do a moose hunt last year. I had a, I had a client with a moose tag and, um, so yeah, we kind of do everything that breathes, you know, and then we do, uh, fishing summer trips you know in the summertime we'll pack into my camp and fish the high mountain lakes um family trips uh, his and her trips whatever kind of the, the summer trips we can kind of cater to whatever needs you you want um i've had a lot of interest lately in like the ladies trips you know like bachelorette <laughs> <laughs> uh, not even so much that just uh, you know it, it's hard to get the guys to go on a summer trip you know when it costs half as much as an elk hunt they're like well hell i'll just save another year and go on an elk hunt um the ladies you know aside from a few ladies i have had hunting most of them are like yeah the weather will be warm we'll go up there eat some good meals, maybe see some fantastic view. You know, we're as far as a tent camp goes, we're not roughing it by any means. I mean, as far as I view things, you know, you could be sleeping in a little pop-up tent on a little tiny air mattress and have just enough room 
to sit up, put your socks on, you know, I mean, I, I wish I could put up some pictures on this thing. Just so, I mean, I got pictures on my website you can see, but, um, I put up a pretty luxurious hunting camp, we'll call it. <laughs> and I wish I had some better pictures of camp on there. I, I'm in the process of kind of rebooting my website and getting it better, but I don't like the gallery system that's on there. Mm. Are but, any of these, uh, are any of these hunts over the counter? Like, can you do like lion over the counter or did everything require points? Any of, any of the predator hunts are over the counter bear lion wolves all over the counter. Um, the elk and deer a draw and the moose sheep and goat are a draw and the, the fishing trips and stuff that's all over the counter so if people have listened to us ramble and talk for you know over an hour and are interested in maybe something like this or just chatting with you about a hunt where's the best place for one for them to reach out for you and what's uh what's your website uh the website is steel creek outfitters dot net and the <coughs> excuse me the Email address is steelcreekoutfitters at gmail.com. And my f- personal phone number is also on the website. Um, get on there. Honestly, you can send me an email. I know a lot of people do that these days, and I'm trying to get better at it. But if you want to get in touch with me and, and get direct, definite answers the phone calls the better way to go um and i just think it's a little more personable you know you kind of get to hear but you're you can't see who you're talking to so you might the next best thing is to actually be able to hear somebody live on the phone <laughs> um i know the email is convenient because you can go back and look at it as many times as you want you know it's it's in writing so you can you don't forget things and my advice there would be if you're going to call and ask me a bunch of questions about the hunts have a pen and paper um you know and and don't don't be scared to ask whatever questions i've i've heard them all you know um and i answer i answer the same questions daily but for me, it's, it's better to kind of screen people, you know, I mean, some of the hunts I offer aren't for everybody. Um, I will tell you that all of my hunts are very physical. So the better you can be in, the better trip you're going to have. And, uh, the guy that I actually hooked up with Trent through is Rob and, he has a deal called wilderness physical therapy and I've been working with him the last few months trying to get some stuff going to where, you know, clients that I book, I'll refer him, you know, I'll refer him he sets up a, a fitness plan for you to, tr- to try and get, get in better shape for that hunt or whatever trip you're coming on. And I, I think it's really important. To do something you know i know you're not not everybody's going to be in the greatest shape possible but anything and everything that you do will help you can ask trent not prepared well the the opportunity came too fast for him, you know like it was i think i called him Maybe I called him like the last week of April and I was like, yeah, let's get something set up. He's like, yeah, for sure. Let's, let's do it. How about the 15th of May? And I'm like, you're on. And so he literally had two weeks to do something about it. And, uh, and he did just fine, but he, he told me several times during the hunt, he's like, I did not prepare for this at all. And I think he, 
you know, just as good as the next guy. But he told he told me he was huffing and puffing, going. He's like, dude, I my heart rate would. Boom, 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 boom. Yeah, yeah. It was uh, it was a good time with those two. They were, they were good clients to have. Yeah. Well, Michael, we really appreciate it. Um, we're gonna put all your information in the the bio of this video and in the podcast and. Um, thank you for doing this. I, I really appreciate it. And we'll definitely do it again sometime. Yeah, no, I appreciate you having me on and thanks for the, the advertising. Of course. Hopefully we'll see you guys up here someday. Thank you guys so much for checking out the Hunter's Advantage podcast. If you enjoyed the episode, make sure to leave us a rating and review on Apple podcast, Spotify, YouTube, or wherever you listen to the podcast. Thank you guys so much. And we'll see you in the next episode.